couple of years ago, the team and I got quite interested in VR, or we're going we're gonna to redo this. Now we're live. Now? OK, glad this is on the internet. Uh, this is CS50. My name is David Malin. And behind CS50 is this amazing production team. And a couple of years ago, we got interested in virtual reality, or VR, which, as you might have noticed, is gaining steam in industry um, and all over the place. And we wanted to be among the first to really start experimenting with it in education, particularly to bring to CS50's various communities around the world, as depicted here in red, our high, our, uh, our high schools using CS50's curriculum in some form, and in blue, our universities using the same really to give them much more of a window, a, a virtual window, into a space like Sanders Theater. And so we set out to record all of CS50's lectures in VR, to experiment beyond the boundaries of the classroom, and really begin to as ascertain what is possible with this technology. So without further ado, CS50's own Dan, Arturo, Scully, and soon Ian. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dan. By way of introduction, I joined CS50 in 2012 on the video team. Um, and that was right when we started the edX platform, um, or started with the edX platform. And so you guys, when did you come on board? Uh, I came on board in 2015. I'm Scully. Um, and I was working um, at Hauser Studio for a little bit. And then I uh, was able to transition to over here. Um, and uh, it's been an exciting time. We've been tackling a lot of new things and excited to share VR with you guys. Uh, I'm Ian. I started a little after Scully in 2015. Um, right at the beginning of the experiments with VR. Um, so it's been sort of a very interesting and crazy ride. But yeah, go for it. Uh, I'm Arturo, and today, I in about two weeks, I'll have been on board for a year now, nice. which was fun. Uh, and yeah, it's been very exciting to s work with these guys and sort of learn everything that uh, they have to showcase about virtual reality as well as production overall. Sweet. And so we're going to give you guys a little bit of an overview of our VR production today. So we'll focus mainly on video production in 360, um, but we will also talk a little bit about other applications. So first of all, making video, have, who, has, who knows what VR is? Who's put on a headset before? <laughs> Lots of people, OK. Anybody not put on a headset before? Come on, don't be shy. <laughs> Somebody hasn't put on a headset in this room. I'm going to give you the opportunity right now. No? No hands? Wow. All right. Well, we're going to do a demo anyway. So would somebody like to come up for the person who's being quiet and one, is not putting their hand up, would they like to come up and do a demo and see what, put on one of the headsets for us to show everybody what the experience is like? I need a volunteer. In the back. Come on, guys. We're going to get you moving. This is not a free lunch. There's no such thing as a free lunch. All right. Chris is coming up. Hello. All right. So have you put on a headset before? All right, well, this is going to be exciting. So we're going to put you into our HTC Vive. Okay. And so what you do, you want to stand right in the middle here. Let me disconnect this. So you are tethered with the cable. But go ahead and put that on. Get a comfortable place around your head. And for everybody else, if you can full screen this. We're going to put you into Fruit Ninja. Have you played that on a device before? No. iPhone, iPad? Nothing. All right. Are you seeing uh, some fruit in front of you? Yeah. Do you see, hold on, two katana swords in front of yes. you? Yes. All right, grab those. <laughs> Are you? Yep, okay. there you go. You got it? Yeah. OK, so the whole thing is you're just going to gonna slash. So as the fruit comes at you, just go ahead and slash. Nice. <laughs> nice, good combo. Right. Very nice, very nice. Round of applause, please. I'll grab these from you. We'll take the headset off of you. Sorry. No problem. All right, so as you can see, 360 is a, it's a pretty immersive world. And we just saw like, the application of a game, which is a fun demo and you know, pretty intuitive for somebody who's never put the headset on before to just dive in and, and experience. Um, so, but in the world of video, it's much harder to kind of create the experience with, uh, with no kind of uh, breaking of reality. So um, there's a great guide if you're getting into 360 video production. Has anybody d dove into that before? Has anybody made a 360 video? I see a couple. Are you guys thinking about it? Yeah? OK. So it's hard. There's a great guide online um, at making360.com that kind of is a great kind of bootstrapping, get yourself started guide to making 360 video. It's what we started with and kind of have expanded from there. So 
we said, what is VR, right? You guys, we just saw a good, a good experience where we used our HTC Vive, but there are actually multiple headsets that you can get. So at top right, we have the Oculus Rift, which was the first to market, uh, started on Kickstarter uh, just a couple of years ago, finally came to market last year. At top right, we have the HTC Vive, and that is what uh, we just saw the demo with. At bottom left, we have this interesting kind of entry-level device. This is a Gear VR headset, and the idea with this is you take your Samsung phone, if you already have one, you put it in this piece of plastic. This piece of plastic only costs $100. So if you have the phone already, it's little entry cost to get into the game. Um, and then you, know, you can actually hook up a controller to this and play games. You can watch video. And it'll actually use the phone's sensors to actually track your movement. So if you're watching a video in 360, it'll track your head movement for you and, and play it back. So it's kind of neat. Um, and then the you know, even cheaper option is the Google Cardboard you may have heard of. And so I found this experience to be a little bit lacking. You know, it's not very comfortable to put on your head. Uh, but it does exist, and it's kind of neat. You can buy these pretty cheaply and hand out to people if you are you know, releasing a video, for example. And the last one at bottom right is the uh, PlayStation VR, um, which is just another offering. They all pretty much do the same thing. All their specs are reasonably the same. Um, they have slightly different features, but we can talk about that more later. All right, so you all heard of VR. How about augmented reality, AR? We know what this is. I see some nods. I see Pokemon Go might look familiar to some people in this room. Yeah, I'm getting more nods. OK. <laughs> so uh, augmented reality is where you're not exactly taken out of the world that you're in and put into a new world. It's where you're actually experiencing the world you're in with an, like an overlay, for example. Um, and so Microsoft's offering of this, if we're getting into the headset world, is the Microsoft HoloLens, um, which is pretty neat. Because when you put this on, i to make this a little bigger. I can still see all of you, you can see all of me, but I get an overlay in front of me that maps in real time. So as I track my head around, I can change settings with hand gestures and click and touch. And what it looks like is kind of like this. Granted, that's a marketing photo. But the idea is you can take things like a, a browser or uh, they have little animated creatures, and you can slap windows around your environment. So it's almost like if you're you know, doing some spreadsheet work and you need to have something up next to you, you can just like put multiple windows up and, and see them all in real time and not be taken out of your world. So just kind of a neat way to uh, experience your, your existing world without being taken out of it. So what is the history of VR? Does anybody know how far this technology goes back? A long ways. A long ways, yeah, about 1860s, right? So the, one of the first uh, examples of this was artists doing uh, murals in the round. So they would actually paint around them in 360 and put you into that world so you could actually experience you know, being taken out of your world and put into this virtual world. In the 1920s, there was the first flight simulation device. Um, we kind of stepped up the game a little bit in, the, in 1957 when the Sensorama device existed. We're still not in the realm of head-mounted headsets, but um, you know, you had a screen, you had fans blowing, you had uh, smell sense added, which you know, fortunately for today is not yet viable with the, the headsets that exist. Um, in 1968, we got the first head-mounted display, which uh, in, in the 80s was used by NASA to kind of research interactions between humans and computers, try to make workflows more efficient. And then in 1987, we got the term virtual reality actually coined, um, at which point things kind of stepped up a little bit. And the next big leap in the technology was just in these past few years when we got all these consumer grade headsets coming out where you could actually go and experience this technology you know, in your living room for relatively cheaply. It's not, still not cheap to get into the game. If anybody's wondering like, what the price point is to get in, all of the, the Vive and the Oculus Rift, those headsets are on the order of five, $600, but you also have to have a PC to use them. And it has to be powerful enough to actually drive the headset. And the cost of that PC minimally is about $500. So you're looking at $1,100, $1,200 just to get into the game uh, if you're not using just the Gear VR headset. All right, so looking at 360 video. So, you know. We're all filmmakers, and we like to make movies. And we're used to working with this traditional frame. And you can you know, guide your viewer. You tell your story. And it's up to you how, you how you drive and motivate them. But it's a whole different world when we get into 360 video. So what you're doing is when you take 360 video, you've got the camera in the middle. And you can literally see all the way around everything that's around, right? for better or for worse. And what we do is we take that so uh, in software, we take this you know, mapping of however many cameras you're using, however many lenses you're using, and we project it into a, a 2D image so we can work with it in post-production, and so that we can then put it into a headset and play back the experience for people who are wearing the headset. And what this looks like is this. Has anybody know, seen this frame before? Right, so it's colorful and, and pretty in this setup, but this is called an equirectangular frame. And what this represents is each uh, color that you see represents a different camera. And so we're looking at the output of two different rigs once all the cameras have been taken and stitched together and put into a frame that represents kind of 
the world, right, the 360 world, and it gets projected around you. So you would take this output and load it into your camera, or sorry, into your headset, and then you'd be able to look around and experience the world around you. Um, we get into issues where we actually get the two cameras where they, they come together. So parallax is like the, the difference that you see when you look at something from one point versus the same point at another perspective. So you're kind of, uh, you get this error where, you, where your images kind of meet and you have to decide how you want to stitch that. And typically you can make this choice, you're either stitching for close to the camera, medium range or long range. And if you really want to get fancy, you can actually composite um, multiple together. But Ian's going to talk about that when we get to post-production a little bit more later. Um, but you get these kind of errors, uh, if you will. And what they look like, uh, you can see in the, the top left frame, there's like a line kind of blurred um, at the corner of the car. And on the, down here on the table, there's like a, a cable that's been kind of cut out. And there's like a, the table is no longer round. There's this kind of error. And so this is, the, this is called the stitching error. And this is if you are not careful to kind of put your footage back together um, in a careful way. And so there's different levels of post-production you can do. There's very quick to very lengthy and involved. And uh, we'll toss that to Ian in a few. So what this means is that you need to know what your world looks like when you're shooting this. So if you're using a camera that has six cameras in it, you need to know at what point the seam, where the seams are for cameras so that you can direct your action around that. Anything that's happening that's important that you want to make sure you don't like get a stitching error, you want to make sure that you're guiding the, your talent um, when you're making your movie or your film or whatever you're making and put them in between the seams. So it's important to know, have monitoring or previewing of some kind so you know where to put seams. Um, you know, it's, it's much harder. Close to, the closer you get to the camera, the more you're going to see errors. It's just easier to have things happen. You want to cross stitch points further at a distance. Um, and you want to make sure that people aren't just sitting in a seam if you're directing a scene. Which takes us to the many, many rigs that now exist. So we got into this just over a year ago, and we started looking to see what was out to market. And it was really, really hard at that point in time. It still is. But uh, people were. You know, lots of things were on the horizon. Samsung had an offering. GoPro uh, had an offering coming. GoPro had nothing official from themselves, but people were taking GoPro cameras, 3D printing rigs, and putting them together so that you could put them uh, into, into practice. And it was just a, a challenging world to be in. We went to NEB two years ago, and everybody had VR stuff, but nobody was selling it yet, uh, the one exception being this Ozo camera in front of you here. So one of the easiest rigs to use, which we actually used for a project called Around the World, is the Ricoh Theta. Um, and I'm going to kick it over to Scully to tell you about how we use this camera. Okay, so um, one of our, so this is a, we created a playlist. So the, the object, uh, the objective of this project was to connect our, our students that are around the world in our CS50X program. Um, and it was also inspired by um, the Hello Worlds uh, videos where students would say, hello world, and they would send videos to us here and David for uh, CS50 Live would um, feature them in a segment called Hello World. Um, and so stemming from that idea of connecting students virtually, we decided to try it out um, in 360. Um, and so we created this kit uh, through a lot of trial and error uh, of trying to figure out how do we send a camera across the world uh, make sure that they are know how to use this new technology and um, how can it be watchable? Because what we found out <laughs> as we like demoed in the office and sending like our producers out with a camera and saying, okay, just shoot something, show us like your world, show us like your story. And uh, what we realized that uh, moving the camera is really sickening. <laughs> um, and uh, it can be really distracting and how do you how do you focus a viewer's attention to the person actually talking to you um, when you can see around the entire world that they're sitting in? So we we made suggestions. Um, you know, obviously, as you send them a camera, you say, you know, take us somewhere. They, it's up to them wherever they want to take us, however they want to do it. But um, we came up with like a little hello pamphlet that kind of. Um, talks about like the workflow and what we plan to do with it, like all of the buttons and everything. Um, how many of you have used a Rico Theta or seen one? Nice, Joe. Cool. Um, yeah, so it's um, a really awesome small camera that um, you can charge it and download your footage via USB which is super convenient. Uh, we would send them, because we realized how much movement is impacted when you're watching it, um, we sent them with a selfie stick. 
which is a great way to uh, you know, stabilize the footage, but also get some distance so we get more of an idea of what their space is, because the further they are from the camera, the more we're going to get to see if they're like this. We're really going to see their face and then everything behind them. Um, so it's a super small camera. And um, it has two different modes. It has a picture mode and a video mode. And it also can be controlled via Wi-Fi on your phone. Downloading the app, super convenient, really amazing. Um, you can preview it while you're, while you're recording or before you record. Um, you know, the trick with VR, as Joe can tell you, and as all of you can say, speak to um, when you're recording, if you don't want to be seen in it, you got to be somewhere else, right? So if you were to drop this down, <laughs> you'd disappear behind some furniture, then you could view it on your phone and uh, press record. So um, it was a really great project. Um, people responded really well to it. Um, it was amazing to get to see. And so this playlist really features um, some of the places that the students across the world took us to. We had um, a school in Bangladesh, a women's college in Bangladesh, that we got to speak to 15 students. They took us to their favorite spot um, on the roof or in the student center or at the house. And um, we ended up touching um, seven different co uh, countries. Um, and, and so this idea also stemmed from our producer, Connor. Well, um, um, and he's, he's on his way, or he is in London right now, but um, he was the one that came to us uh, a year and a half ago, or two years, and said, I really love VR, and I love what you guys are doing. I really want to explore VR with you. Um, and so he's helped us a lot along the way with his research and his excitement about VR. Um, and so he really dreamed up this particular project and was like, what if we do Hello World and we actually get to see their world? And was like, yes, Connor. Um, so I helped him run with it, as, as did the whole team, um, trying to figure out what was, what was the thing that we needed to send them with in order to be successful with this project. Um, and it's just grown and grown from there. Um, and now we're transitioning because of our high school um, AP curriculum, that now we're getting high schools more involved, student, high school students more involved in like showing their world and communicating to us and exploring VR as well. So um, it's been a really exciting project. That was, that's one of our featured projects. And here's a map uh, which Scully alluded to, and these are just the points that we've gotten videos back from. Is that the yep. case? Mm -hmm. cool. Yep. Um, oh, yep. and this is uh, a group of some of our teachers that are going to have access to these cameras. Um, to take into their classrooms and to explore VR either in lesson or letting them explore, uh, students explore on their own. So. All right, so when we started, like we started playing with the Ricoh, which is really a neat camera because uh, it's only got two lenses on it, so it's very easy to kind of stitch together. It does it automatically for you, and there's very little room for actually stitching errors because you've only got one point where you've got, you know, or both sides, I guess, goes all the way around the camera, where you have to merge those two images together. So that's one nice feature about that camera as well. But you don't get the resolution that you get with uh, more cameras put together. So our first rig that we played with was the one you see on TV here. And this was a set of six GoPros. And it was kind of neat. Right? We took it over to Hauser Studio and started playing with it. And we realized that this particular rig overheated in seven minutes. And so <laughs> our aspiration in CS50, our first venture, was to actually record our full-length lectures and put them online so people could come from anywhere in the world, put the headset on, and feel like they're sitting in Sanders Theater and watch CS50's lectures. Um, but seven minutes, you know, David is quick. He's a fast talker, <laughs> but he's not that fast. So uh, you know, part of the thing like in getting into this was that everybody was getting into this at the same time. And still today, people are figuring out how this works. So even the manufacturer was like, we can't really help you with overheating it. Try putting ice in between all the cameras. Like, that's not a good solution, right? <laughs> so the next step that we did was we got a different rig, which is the one that's standing on the stand over there um, with the blue around the cameras. And they're just a little bit farther apart. And the cameras actually vent enough that you uh, only overheat after many hours. I don't think we actually got that one to overheat at all. No, so um, we realized, OK, we can run with this one for a good two hours, three hours without an issue. It's all about the size of your SD cards that are in each camera. Um, but then it comes to like put all the cameras together. And has anybody used a GoPro before? Technical crowd here. Has anybody had a GoPro crash in them before? Hopefully, everybody who said yes ha can say, yes, 
I've had my GoPro crash as well. They're pretty unreliable cameras. Like they're great, great price, great form factor, but they are not reliable. So um, you know, and if you have six cameras shooting your your sphere around you, and you have one camera die, right? That's going to be a big black window in your sphere, right? It's not a it's something you want, I and mean, we don't want the camera that's facing David on Sanders stage to be the one that goes down. So uh, we were like, okay, this is this is you know a good backup solution, but this is not really viable for actually recording lectures. GoPro since I should say has released the Omni. This is their uh, their offering, which you can get now, um, and this supposedly solves all the issues, including the issues of synchronization, because uh, one step in the post-production process is to actually align all your cameras. GoPros don't have this magic thing where you can hit a button and they all start perfectly at the same frame, so you have to then, in post-production, align them as well. Um, but this is supposed to solve all those issues. Disclaimer, I have not actually used it, so I can't speak to it. Um, at the time, whoops. Uh, okay. We're going to sidetrack for a second. I'm going to kick it over to Ian to talk about synchronization and some of the post-production workflow. So um, the main thing with these rigs, anything that is hand-built like this, you actually have to, this is an image um, taken from Nuke where they've actually built a camera rig. Um, they've modeled the camera positions. And one of the things with the, the GoPros is if you know anything about their manufacturer, they're essentially a lens that's glued to a sensor that's packaged in a box, right? So the tolerances vary from each camera to each camera. And when you're trying to stitch together accurately six different of the six uh, different cameras that have different tolerances, um, you can run into some serious problems. So one of the things you have to do is actually sort of take the rig that you own and build a virtual uh, map of it, so that when you project it into the post production software, you can stitch it together more accurately. Um, so, so to the cameras like the Ozo, which are sort of internally um, all the, all the lenses are joined together in internally. You don't actually need to do this, right? Because they've built the software and the camera is basically like designed in a way where you don't need to model the rig, right? They've already done, done that step for you. So this is one of the main problems with trying to build rigs like this. You could build a, a VR rig out of red cameras. We looked into that. It was far too complicated, I think, really, because modeling these rigs is like, if you're off by a few millimeters or a couple degrees in either way, the seams just sort of blow out and everything falls apart. So we, when we first started, we're using Nuke, um, which is a nodal-based uh, post-production like VFX software, and to stitch together the GoPros. And so the synchronization was like a major issue, which is just getting all the GoPros to start at the same time and make sure that one camera's not sort of a couple frames ahead of the other five cameras. We found the best way to do this with the GoPros is a rope light. Right? So you stand with the rope light around the cameras and you just turn it on. And then that way you get like sort of an instant moment in every single camera. Um, There's a pretty green color. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, but so the, the render times in Nuke, right, after you've modeled this and you've done your compositing were like ludicrous. We did a three minute video and it took three and a half days to render, <laughs> right? And so we're talking about doing an hour and a half lecture or something like that. And I queued one up and the, it just broke. Like it just was like, I can't calculate how long this would be. You know, it was like years or something. So, so we, we, you know, the, it was really, really powerful in the way that you could change the mapping of the sphere. Because essentially, right, there's, a, there's the camera and you're projecting the image on a sphere that's some diameter or radius away from the camera. And you could move that, right? So you could stitch for close objects, medium or far. And you could actually keyframe that through your video. So if someone's close and then they start to walk back, you can move the, the projection sphere with them. So it's incredibly powerful, but just incredibly slow. So we had to transition away from that. And one of the things we found when we went to NAB was um, this Ozo, which essentially does all of that sort of compositing for you and outputs um, that through uh, 12D. This is just an, a, an image of the nodal-based stuff. So you'd have all your camera angles will come in, it goes to a processing node and whatever. It's a very interesting piece of software. You should play around with it sometime, but it's, it wasn't going to work for us. Um, so the Ozo actually has eight cameras. The two cameras on the front actually form a stereoscopic pair. They're about the distance apart of your eyes. So the nice thing, wherever this camera is pointed, the front part is actually in 3D, right? Because it measures the, the parallax between those two and then projects in each eye a, the, a difference. And then outputs um, a single SDI output into a HyperDeck, which is there. They're basically just using it to write data. And it's just this huge package of bits that then their software will take apart, break into the different camera angles, and stitch for you 
pretty much automatically. There's a few parameters that you can change. You can change where the seams occur. You can change the size of the overlap and things like that to help you with stitching errors. But it's, there's not a lot of um, finesse in their software. But they do it all for you, and it actually happens in a relatively short amount of time. So solution-wise, it's, it's the best of both worlds. And it's also, if I can just add, it's yeah. very versatile too, right? If you want to take the output of this camera and go into Nuke, totally possible. You just export each camera separately yeah. and then merge them into Nuke as well. Right. And so for those who, uh, you know, Nuke is too long and too pricey to get into time-wise to learn, and uh, you don't have an Ozo, like what are the other options? So there's things like Autopan Ogiga um, and a few other, like, um, software packages that are were started as uh, panoramic photo stitchers and then you know they solved that problem where you sort of take 15 shots in a row and you could stitch them all together with your like DSLR or something like that and then they translated those into video and sort of worked out the mathematics for taking six cameras and arranging them in a sphere um, and those are much lower cost and the workflow is a little bit tedious sometimes you have to go in and um, It'll do an auto stitch, but then you've got to go in and clean up the stitch, which means you've got to find a point in this, that this camera can see and this camera can see and tell the software that it's the same point and it sort of recalculates. So cleaning those, um, those stitch lines is a little bit tedious, but it, it does a, a very decent job. And the cost for entry to that software is you know a couple hundred bucks, right? At the lowest tier up to like maybe 900 or something. And for, it's pretty fast. And it's very, yeah, comparatively much faster than new. Yeah. So. And I teach the intro to media class here at the Harvard Extension School. Um, and I just did a demo with the GoPro for the first time since we were experimenting back in the day. And I have to say the software's gotten a lot better and a lot faster. So if anybody is looking to experiment with it, the AVP, which is made by a company called Kohler, um, which was bought by GoPro. So it's all becoming this nice ecosystem to work within yeah. um, if you're using uh, cameras like GoPros. Yep. In terms of the Ozo, actually, uh, if anybody um, is messing around with that at any point, they're actually releasing an update uh, somewhat soon that won't that will take care of some of the issues that Ian mentioned. And uh, the, one of the cool things about it, much like the GoPro, I think, is that you can actually just download it and install it into your system. You don't have to buy new hardware or a whole new set of cameras to to do that. So that's also very useful. Yeah. And just if anybody's wondering, Nokia, yes, it is the same Nokia that made the phones mm -hmm. that everybody used to use. And I think they're still a phone manufacturer, but you know, are they having a rebirth as, <laughs> as a VR camera maker? Maybe. It's a really nice quality. It's a very nicely machined, very high quality, very reliable piece of hardware. I will say that. Yeah. All right, so Ian mentioned you know, stereoscopic. That's camera to stereoscopic. So there's two ways you can have 360 video. One is monoscopic, where there's no depth mapping for you. And one is stereoscopic, where you know, as like David on the stage of Sanders comes up and tears the phone book and throws it at you, um, it feels like the phone book's coming towards you. Like, has anybody put on the 3D glasses and sat and watched a 3D movie on their 3D TV, which nobody cares about anymore? <laughs> um, so it's the same kind of thing, except instead of just being able to see, you know, the screen, TV screen in front of you, you've got the ability to, you know, move your head around and look and have everything be kind of have depth for you. Um, it does complicate the post-production side of things a little bit, uh, but I think the outcome is a lot better. And you have to start thinking about what you want your offering to be right when you start your project. Because even when you're determining which rig to use, like the GoPro, your only option is to have a monoscopic, monoscopic image. Um, and so this is just a screenshot from the Oza software, and this is the equa rectangular frame of Sanders Theater. So what you're seeing in this image is actually the entire theater, theater including behind, above, below the camera. Um, and so that's what this kind of distortion is. In the middle, the two lenses are pointing in the front to, to see David on stage, and then the rest of it um, is just everything else in the theater. And we put it in a position that you would sit, and you kind of feel like you're in the front row of class as a student. Um, you know, the outcome of this, uh, you've got your stereo right and stereo left eye, and you can see that, uh, you know, left eye, David is center, and the right eye, David is slightly offset, and that's that stereo disparity so that uh, you get the feeling of depth when you actually watch the lecture. And we digitally inserted this uh, screen here, which matches the projection, because uh, one thing that really stinks about all of this hardware, um, especially it's the, the headsets, all of them, not just the Gear VR, but the Oculus Rift and the uh, HTC Vive, the resolution really stinks. It's very low. and so. I notice that when you put the headset on, it just feels very, it kind of takes you out of the immersion of it a little bit, because you put it on, and you're like, wow, this is cool. It feels seamless because it's tracking my head. But then you start to see all the pixels, and you lose all the detail, uh, because it's just the resolution is so low. And I think that'll be one of the biggest things going forward, is once they figure out how to cram more pixels onto the screens themselves that you put over your face, it's going to feel a lot more immersive. Um, all right. So 
uh, if anybody wants to, you can also, on YouTube, see this view. This is an anaglyph view. And if you have the, the red and blue glasses, like, uh, like those guys, you can actually pop those on and watch them <laughs> in 3D from your browser as well. Um, and this is the final. So when you do stereoscopic production, this is what the ultimate outcome is. You've got the equirectangular frame um, for the you know, left eye on top, right eye on the bottom. And then it's uh, your, your phone or your headset will know how to play this back when you load it into the player. You, you specify either with a file naming convention or in the software that you're playing back on, this is a stereoscopic or 360 video. But this is, should suggest a trade-off, right? Where monoscopic, you would have the whole frame filled with your um, single image. And here, you get the perception of depth, right? But you're all, each eye is only getting half the resolution, right? So that sort of loss of resolution becomes more apparent. So it, it's a, it's a trade-off between, you know, do I want a little bit more detail, or do I want sort of the sensation of three-dimensional depth? Yeah. And we decided the three-dimensional depth was important just because you do feel so much more immersed as things move towards you. You kind of, you know, jump, jump a little bit. And we solved the resolution problem with the superimposition of the screen, right? Yeah. So the content was available. Sure. Um, and so, you know, this is just a screenshot of the Nokia Ozo post-production software. They call it Ozo Creator. And this is just a view from Sanders Theater of, uh, you know, each camera, the eight lenses that are sitting on the Ozo rig itself, which get merged into that equirectangular frame. So uh, when you're not talking about CS50 lecture production and you actually have uh, like a narrative story or something like that, you have to, Scully alluded to like holding up the Ricoh Theta and like, you know, hiding behind a couch, right? We call this camouflaging your crew. When you're, you know, the, the best illusion I can make to this is the Muppets. So uh, Jim Henson on the image on the right, when in the original Muppet movie, actually operated in a diving bell under the water and shoved his hand up through uh, into Kermit and then had, you know, a second hand controlling the hand. And he had a monitor between his legs and he sat there for hours just making Kermit move so that nobody would see the Muppeteer and it felt very seamless. And if you've seen the movie, um, you know, the effect is, is great, but this is what they went through to actually do it. Um, and so it's the same kind of thing in VR video production where, uh, you know, you need a good way to monitor what's going on so that you don't have to be sitting right at the camera because you're going to have to either paint yourself out later or you're going to have to incorporate yourself in the shot. So we call this camouflaging the crew and you just need to take that into consideration. And even lighting, right? There's not a good place to put lighting. Some people put like uh, on the, like the post that holds the camera up, you can put lights on, which kind of gives you like a, an eye light or a little bit of fill light. But uh, you really need to use practical fixtures to actually light your scene because there's nowhere to hide anything. So just something to, to keep in mind. And when we talk about you know, storytelling um, or narrative pieces um, or more creative pieces, you also have to figure out how to direct the viewer. In, in the 2D world, in the 2D world, we, we have this frame that we're used to being able to you know, cut and we can you know, direct the audience to a bear, right? If we want you to look at the bear. But in the, the 360 world, right, you're seeing the whole world. Sorry, the illusion is lost with this clicker. You're mm -hmm. seeing the whole world. Um, and so that you know, it's you as the viewer can choose where to look. But if you want the, the bear to surprise the viewer, you need to find a way to direct the viewer to that. And there's several ways to do that. You can uh, use action. So you can like, have some kind of leading element that wraps around and gets your viewer to actually move that around and, and track it. Um, you can use lighting to kind of highlight something and move the viewer. Or you can use sound and spatialize your audio and actually um, you know, have a sound move around them if they have headphones on, and you'll, your head will turn naturally. Just as a human, your your instincts will cause you to, to I think that's turn. One of the most immersive things you can do is sort of is is build a soundscape so that the viewer's attention gets shifted by, by some noise over here, right? And they start to turn, and then that's when you unfold action over there. Um, which was a major problem when we first started. There was just no solution for that. You'd have to go into like a game engine and basically create a, its own player for each piece, right? Which was, I don't not really sustainable. But there's now a, a, a fair number of solutions on the audio front for yeah. uh, ambisonic audio. Yeah. And the most easy to use one that we've started to work with, which is really, really cool, is Facebook's offering. Facebook's really got into the game of 360 video. Um, if you haven't played with it, they either it's a great platform to use to upload content and share, um, but it's just it's pretty simple. And uh, they have a whole suite of tools and um, Oculus Rift has a whole suite of tools for Unity if you want to do any game development on your own, um, which are very you know, easy to, well documented, easy to find. Um, and so Facebook just released, literally, I think in the past month, this spatial workstation um, where you can actually spatialize your audio. And what that looks like uh, is this. So you, you know, imagine the center of that point there is, is the viewer, right? 
north, south, east, west, as far as like their head movement. And you can click and drag, as you play back video, a sound around them. You can layer multiple sounds. Um, and so if you are monitoring your video and playing it back, um, you can design where you want a particular sound to come from. And this tool will spatialize it for you in a very visual, intuitive way to use, um, which is pretty neat. Um, so just a few projects that we've taken on ourselves. We talked about the VR around the world. Um, what does is, what is CS50's video actually looks like? Let me take a second and actually show you. So uh, we have a, a custom video player for this, which students can use, both edX students, local students um, can use. And so this is a, when you go to play a video, this is the standard version. This is CS50. So this is like uh, you know your traditional lecture capture view where you are watching the, the single frame that we direct the viewer. But with our player, we have a mode with the glass, the goggles here, and so we can click, and we're jumped to the same point in time. You might all oh, enterprises of computer so now, science and the art of programming. You can look around and as if you're my name is David, a student in the class. So you've got kind of two modes because with a two-hour lecture. <laughs> uh, with the uh, with the two-hour lecture, right? I don't think it's compelling to sit there with a the headset on, especially with the lack of resolution that currently exists, um, and the headset gets heavy on your face because they're they're they have some weight to them. Um, but it's kind of neat to be able to jump. You know, let's say we, there's a demo, and you want to see what that looks like as if you were a student in Sanders Theater. You can actually click into this mode and watch that that portion if you wish. Um, you know, you could sit there and watch the whole lecture if you wanted to, but you don't have to. So that was kind of our our version zero, if you will, as far as VR experience goes. Thank you. Um, we also took on this project called CS50 Explained. And what this is, is we would take the lectures, we would go into Sanders Theater with David and Doug Lloyd, um, who would, we'd watch you know, certain elements um, for their pedagogy um, in the lecture, and we play them back on the projection screen, and the viewer would be the Nokia Ozo sitting right in between David and Doug, so you feel like you're a part of the conversation, and when you watch this back, you actually look left, you can look right, and experience what it's like to be in the middle of the conversation. Granted, you can't interrupt them. Um, they're eating popcorn, so you can't actually eat the popcorn, but you kind of get the feeling of being a part of the conversation, and it's a little bit unnerving, because uh, you actually like are sitting there, and they, they feel pretty close to you, and proximity is another thing to, to consider. Um, you know, If we were to do this again, I think we'd actually push them a little bit farther away, because it's almost uncomfortable comfortably close, <laughs> but you know, you live and learn. You're really in between them. <laughs> yeah. Um, does anybody want to experience this firsthand? We have a live demo. Going to volunteer? I see one being volunteered. Come on up. All right, so let's load it into uh, the Vive here. Yeah, swap sides. And so for this, we're just using software called Virtual Desktop. All right, and so we're going to see a mirrored view of what he's seeing, but he's going to get the stereoscopic depth and everything as well. Uh, you can leave him off, yeah. All right, ready? So I'm going to play, and this will disappear. And so if you uh, look around, look to your left, look to your right, <laughs> right? All of a sudden, you're, you're sitting right. It's pretty unnerving, right? It's a ha little close. Yeah. <laughs> And if you look down, do you see the popcorn? Yeah. So there's a few Easter eggs for those sitting here. You can actually uh, look, David and Doug. At one point, I think Doug puts his arm around you. And another point, David offers you some popcorn. So we had some fun Easter eggs. And you can see in the background, again, we had no camouflage for our crew. We did this uh, the normal way with traditional cameras and doing a, a multi-camera production as well. So we had no way to hide the crew for that, unless we wanted a painstaking to go through and paint things out. So let's get a round of applause for our volunteer. All right, so that was CS50 explained. And so that we, I think we ended up doing about 50 or 60 of these videos over the course of our, our 12 weeks of CS50, um, where you know there's four or five chapters per lecture, which you can also watch in the same video player if you want to see some of the pedagogy behind the CS50 course. Um, and then on the creative side, we just recently debuted our VR music video. And uh, Scully, you want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah, so um, 
We have been working with um, a really great a cappella group on campus um, that we had gotten a chance to partner with um, a couple years back and do a music video with them and we got the awesome opportunity to do it again now in VR using the Ozo and um, we went to the Garden Center, uh, the dance studio um, on Garden Street, which was an amazing space. Um, it was really perfect for what we were trying to do. We really wanted to create an environment that was kind of nonspecific um, so that we could really play with how it feels when you're inside this, this world. Um, so we were um, interested in really utilizing um, shadow, light, proximity um, and kind of the experience of what happens when things are coming at you, what happens if you can't see initially what's going on, like where, like trying to direct people in the space and really have, try, try to influence them and, and see um, what, what is working, you know. Um, so we created this space. Um, and they learned an amazing dance as well as they recorded the song specifically for the video. So we got a really rare opportunity also to, um, because they were newly arranging this song, um, they, get, they recorded it in the studio and then they had their engineers um, see our rough cut of the video, which was just like, it was to introduce like what was happening in the space so then they could use their mix to reinforce the action, which was fantastic. Um, and it, I think it really, it really worked. Um, you get a sense of things happening around you um, and you will all get to experience if you would like. <laughs> um, and it was, a, it was a really wonderful experience. Yeah, and so uh, some of the challenges was like, we wanted this to be an immersive 360 experience. So in the in the picture a couple of moments ago, uh, you saw like we built a set in the round around the camera so that you know, wherever you looked, like the action was happening all around you. And you know sometimes we use this to our advantage to actually like disorient the viewer. Sometimes we you know had just one focus point to look at. And so the idea was you would actually go back and watch several times to make sure you didn't miss anything. Um, so it's just an interesting interesting challenge. And we also wanted to play with moving the camera. We, I think Ian mentioned it, like when you start to move the camera, it can easily become, you know, the vomit train, if you will, uh, to put it politely. Um, it just is really, uh, it's very disorienting when, when you are standing still and all of a sudden your whole world starts to move. So it's just something to keep in mind. And we found uh, in our own experiments that moving the camera vertically was the most comfortable thing, but also one of the most impactful things you could do. So when you're at eye height with somebody, you know, you feel kind of at their level, but when you're above or below them, um, it's a very different context to, to the scene. And so what we actually did was we hacked a part of uh, a standing desk to go up and down, which you can see in the middle of this image, um, to bring the Ozo up and down as seamlessly as possible. So um, with doorbell wires. yeah, with doorbell wires. <laughs> <laughs> so that was an inter interesting challenge to solve as well. Um, and so onset monitoring, this is kind of the, the preview we get from the Ozo. You can see the purple indicate our stitch lines that we w avoided the action. So all the choreography we did, we tried to keep as much out of these, uh, these stitch points as possible so that nobody would be kind of distorted as we got to the past the post-production process. And so this is just uh, the equi rectangular frame from live onset. And so what is the future of all of this technology? And I think that like this is uh, the Facebook camera that was just recently announced. And what's cool about this is uh, it has, it's, I think they call it the six degrees of freedom. And so it uses this crazy technology that actually lets you move around a little bit, right? To, to, to date, if you want to move around in a virtual world, you have to have a computer generated world to actually move around. But with this, you can supposedly actually move around a little bit inside of a video that you actually recorded. And it'll use this technology to uh, move you around just a little bit, just like, you know, six degrees. But um, I think that that will make this much more immersive because even when you're watching like CS50's lectures or any of these videos, you're going to have a little bit of natural sway, but it's kind of unnatural to not have the, the, your head movement, your position change as you sway. So that's uh, one thing that I think will be a huge improvement going forward in the future. Um, the other thing is interaction. So there's a whole bunch of companies out there now that uh, create these kind of virtual spaces to interact in. And I have to say, like Facebook, I think, has done the best job of this so far. They just released Facebook Spaces. It's still in beta, um, but we'll demo this for you in a second. But what's cool about this is there's a lot of potential for, for just interacting with other people that have headsets or don't have headsets. So what you can do is um, 
you can interact in an environment together. You can look at watch videos together. You can annotate things together. Um, so there's potential for connecting remote students together, connecting teaching fellows and students together, and just sharing common experiences. And it's just pretty neat. And so when we were testing this, uh, you know, you are an avatar. So I created this avatar of myself. And I conferenced in Christian, who's over here. And we had a little, uh, little FaceTime experience um, in the Facebook world. And they give you this actual selfie camera and a selfie stick. And so we snapped the screenshot together, which is just kind of fun. Um, and if anybody doesn't believe me about uh, you know the world getting getting sick as the world moves, we have a roller coaster example we can play for you in the headsets too. Um, so we just want to conclude with this demo of the Facebook Spaces, and then stick around because we have a whole bunch of demos. You can actually come up and put the headset on and, and see some of the videos we've made and others have made, um, which is just really interesting. So without further ado, let me jump over to the Facebook Spaces. Yeah. And so this we have set up on the Oculus Rift. And I have to, I'm, I'm sorry, face away from you, because uh, with the HTC Vive, we have sensors in the ceiling on both sides. But with the Oculus Rift, they're in front of you. So without turning the whole station around, I have to turn around and face this way. All right, and so can you all see what I'm seeing? Is this full screened? Yes. Great, so this is the default virtual world that uh, Facebook puts you into. I'm around a table. I can connect with, I believe it's five other people in headsets around this table as avatars to work with me. If you want to see what I look like, I can grab uh, the selfie stick, right? And uh, there's me. Hello. <laughs> um, which is kind of fun. There's also, uh, you know, I can grab the, the pencil here and I can actually draw around me. I can say hello. Whoops. I don't handwrite anything anymore. If I want to, I can try to grab this and move it around and I can decorate my space. If I want to put this picture up that I took, uh, I can resize it. And it's all pretty intuitive, right? I can decorate my space. If I don't like this park I'm in, I want to make it more academic. Maybe I just load in uh, a whole different world. And now suddenly we're transported to Sanders Theater. I can just uh, get rid of this text now. Um, and if I'm bored here and I want to connect with some other people, I can, let's see, let's see who's online here. So we can try a video call, conference somebody in here, yeah. right? And so you can see, they can see this, uh, this world here, just like you would expect. And so here we go, hello, David. So here's what David is seeing, right? If I want to grab uh, our selfie stick, we can take a picture together. There we go. <laughs> we can now decorate, uh, decorate this space too. All right, so we got uh, a whole bunch of stuff going on. If we want even more, I can go to my, my timeline and I can grab a, a video and, and play this back for, with multiple people. So even in my video call, this is going to uh, play back the video. Don't fail, live demo, don't fail. Let's try another one. We'll go to uh, this one. All right, well, oh, I hear it, I hear it. Uh, for some, something is messed up here. Well, beta. take my word for it. It's a beta example. <laughs> Technology, everybody. So let's jump back to this one. So uh, thank you all for coming. We're going to conclude our live stream here. Um, but stick around, come up, ask us questions, put on headsets, and try stuff out. We have a really cool flight simulator. Totally non-academic, but really fun to put on and crash planes. So uh, um, thank you all for coming.